the notorious B.I.G. Got <laughs> born on May 21st. I think it was like 1978 or something. Chris Wallace. Jeez. I know. I don't know good. that he would have left. I don't know that he would have lived this long. He he might have lived this long. Yeah, he's probably. Well, I mean, considering <laughs> his BMI and his poor food choices, I mean. he liked he liked cheese, eggs and Welch's grape. That is actually a thing that he said. He was talking. That's a, that's like a two o'clock meal. So in the context of that song and the notorious B.I.G. song. He said that he wants to eat cheese, eggs, and Welch's grape. And that was a, like a 2 a.m. after a club. Because Diddy wants to, you know, get with your friends. They can, we can be friends. Is that all right with you? Is that all right? That, that was a that was line. But I don't know if Christopher Wallace would have lived with his BMI because he had That's very poor saying. nutritional habits. That and he engaged in gunplay, which is initially what <laughs> killed him. You know, he didn't die of food poisoning. He died of lead poisoning, as it were. So... Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the One's Ready Team Room. That was your history lesson on uh, hip hop and the notorious B.I.G., who was born on May 21st. I want to say 1978, but I'm not Googling it. Tell me about it in the comments. We're back with uh, Jess Peaches and myself. We want to start off by saying thanks for following us for all these ramblings. We got a good one for you today. For our P1 listeners, for people that come back all the time, this one is going to be a little bit grade level for you, but it does contain a crap ton of updates in real time. We did some research yesterday with some of our friends to figure out exactly what the CCT pipeline looks like. We are going to walk you through from step one all the way through to your first unit to make sure that you understand exactly what you need to do if you want to be a combat controller in the Air Force. I got the subject matter expert, Jack0001, the man, the myth, the legend. Peach is with me. So we're going to start talking about it. And we're going to start all the way even before entry. So, Peaches, what's the first thing a combat control trainee has to do in order to get into the Air Force? In order to get any, well, you got to listen to the podcast. I, First I, of all, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't make the rules. That's the problem. <laughs> I didn't make the rules. That's just the way it is. Uh, but got it. two, you got to go, you got to go see a recruiter. Now, if, if you're 17 and on, you know, and older, you can go see a recruiter. If you're 16, they may hey, say, Hey, you know, this is great. Appreciate your interest, but I'm not actually able to talk to you right now. So, um, please come back when you're 17. But, you know, for all those folks that are about to graduate, all those seniors that are about to graduate, if you haven't already started talking to a recruiter, you're late. You are really, really late. So right. yeah, go see a recruiter. Um, and, and that's a normal accessions recruiter. You, you don't have to see a special operations recruiter. And to, to kind of that point, they are restructuring the 330th recruiting squadron is kind of restructuring the way they do some of the special operations recruiters and the, um, I forget what they're calling that the new form of, of those recruiters, but, um, you can go see a normal accessions recruiter and then you'll get all your kind of your general stuff done with all the paperwork, all your initial disqualification kind of stuff. Um, and then you'll probably take a trip to MEPS, like your first trip to MEPS. Um, make sure you're good to go physically and that kind of stuff. You don't have any underlying issues. And then they will likely transfer you over to a special operations recruiter uh, to then dive into the development sessions with a T3I developer. And, and uh, not every special operations recruiter has a T3I developer, but a lot of them have extra training in how to run uh, physical training programs and smoke sessions and all that kind of stuff to get help get you prepared for not just physically, mentally, but give you a little peek behind the curtain into what the pipeline is going to be like. Okay, covered way too much ground. Cover, we even Sorry. talked about it before. We covered way too much ground. We hit like nine <laughs> different things. You're mentioning terms we don't even know yet. All right, so square one, everybody. If you were thinking, if you're 17 years old and up, so I'm going to make it into two kind of different categories here. Go to airforce.com. It's simple, airforce.com. And you can actually type in your zip code to find a recruiter. That's how you're no kidding going to find a recruiter. Or I don't know if you know this, the phones that we have in our pocket uh, were actually uh, con contain more computing power than the computers we used to go to the moon the first time. So you can just Google how to find your local recruiter, right? So that's, that's no kidding. Step one. You can also go to afspecwar.com. And you can put in your zip code and it will find you a special operations recruiter if that's who you want to talk to, an AFSPEC war specific recruiter. They're trained, equipped, they have extra knowledge on the career fields, right? So if you want to talk to some folks and you're in that senior year of high school, the 17-year-old range, go check them out. Airforce.com, special opera or um, AFSPECWAR.com, excuse me. If you were under 17, here's what I'll tell you. You need to focus on other stuff, right? You're just like Peach just said, you're 
the recruiter does not have all the time in the world to talk to every single 14 year old that eventually wants to be a PJ. So here's what I'll tell you. We got a discord. If you want to go on the discord and you want to start bringing in a whole bunch of information and you want to start reading up on the history and you want to start leaning into it, that's the best thing that you can do because it's all self-driven. We can get you the discord. We're going to be putting a bunch of cards in this episode because we have episodes on all this stuff, right? We will put in a bunch of cards when we talk about fitness tests, we're not going to go through the fitness tests in this episode. What we're going to do is we're going to link you to the episode that we already did, and you'll be able to go do that, right? So step one, you're going to find yourself a recruiter, and you're going to start having the conversation with the recruiter. Uh, Peaches, what are some pitfalls that you've noticed for candidates talking to the recruiter? We get a bunch of, you know, people DM us all the time. They're like, the big one for me that jumps out is, well, I, I texted the recruiter. They just haven't texted me back. We're like, well, how long has it been? They're like, oh, a day. Or, you know, I emailed them and, you know, whatever. You got anything on that one? We answer it a lot. Yeah, I would say pump the brakes a little bit, like be a little patient. Uh, you know, we had Tech Sergeant uh, Testa Verde on and she said, uh, you know, that she is working around the clock to answer emails, text messages, DMs, phone calls, and people that actually visit the office. So when you put, you know, all five of those together, and then imagine that it's not a quick, you know, hey, Aaron, this is going to be it. And then this is what you're going to do. OK, later. It, it's probably no less than a 20 minute conversation on a phone call. So mm -hmm. those all pile up. And, and guess what? Yes, there are recruiting issues with the DOD, but the Air Force is not hurting as bad as the others at mm -hmm. all. So right. which is why we are a lot, uh, you know, the the entry level uh, standards are more stringent to get in, in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, legal matters, certain drugs, depth perception, vision, that all that kind of stuff. Right. So understand that it is going to take them a little bit. So maybe if you don't hear something in a week, maybe ping them again, you know, maybe mm -hmm. they were on leave TDY getting training. Cause they, those recruiters, they have training that they have to accomplish too. So yeah. when they're out of the office for a week for that training, all of those messages and texts, they They're all just pile piling up. up. Yeah. Right. And, and maybe because our recruiters are working really hard, maybe they need, you know, a week of leave in Hawaii or something like that too. <laughs> maybe they need some, <laughs> some work life balance. People forget that recruiting is a job and you have to do training for that job. You know what I mean? Like you still have to do regular Air Force CBTs. You still have to do regular training things. You have to get, maybe they're in an upgrade. Like they have to right. do things as well. So. Great input there. Um, so let's say that all that goes well. You get through, you get to the recruiter, you find one, you decide, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try out this Air Force special warfare thing. We wanna make this super clear. When you're talking to the recruiter, you're not talking about a specific job. You may have a job in mind that you wanna do, but the way that we recruit for special operations now is we use the special, war special warfare operator enlistment vector program or SWOV. Basically what this is, is there's four career fields, TACP, special reconnaissance, pararescue, and combat control. And we're speaking specifically about combat control. So if you know you wanna be a combat controller and you go to the recruiter and they're like, okay, well, you, you're not gonna really have a job. You're gonna go into to this program of SWOV. Think of it like a bucket for everybody that they start off. We've had people DM us and say, oh, well, I think the recruiter's lying to me. They say that I can't pick my job. No, that's totally right. It's a change that's happened in the last couple of years, and we've covered it a bunch of times. But the SWOV program, we put everybody together and we put them in the same development program. So don't worry about it. That's what the program is. It's totally valid. I believe we're still shipping SWOV five times a year. I think there's five separate ship dates throughout the year, but we'll, we'll verify that and I'll put a little note in here, but I believe it's five. So you'll be entered into the SWOV program and the delayed uh, entry program. So you'll be in the DEP, that's a regular Air Force accessions term. So the delayed entry program, the SWOV bucket or the SWOV program. So that means you're going into aspect war. And then Peach has alluded to it already, but you'll start going to development sessions, right? You'll have the initial fitness test and I will put a card right here about the initial fitness test because we did a whole episode on initial fitness test. There's a called a candidate fitness test and then there's the operator fitness test. There's three separate ones. We will we will get you the numbers that you need in that other episode. So don't focus on it here. But basically what T3I is going to do is they are going to start training you physically, mentally, and then culturally, like getting you sensitized 
to go to basic training. That's their whole job is to get you to basic training as a civilian and be successful when you show up. So you're going to do kind of like three different things, right? Everybody thinks that this is just about aft spec war and doing push-ups and hoo yah and running around. Okay, that's a part a of it. A lot of hoo yah, A lot of hoo A lot of dog. A lot of open. So yes, you're going to do a lot of that stuff, right? Like you're going to do a lot of physical preparation because people fail for physical stuff. It's very hard. Great. Got it. But the other things they're going to do is they're going to start even teaching you how we talk. We talk differently in the Air Force than you do as a civilian. There is a cadence. There is an expectation. There are cultural standards and norms that you have to learn. And they are really good about that. And they work hand in hand with your recruiter to get you stuff like the reporting statement. So when you get to basic training, sir, ma'am, airman love reports as ordered, right? Like it seems like a dumb thing, but you're going to screw that up. Like you'll be like, uh, reporting is ordered. And they're going to be like, Oh, what are you a journalist? Uh, I don't know what they say now. <laughs> that probably is some weird like that. That's what they said like 21 years ago when I went through basic training. Oh, what are you, a journalist? And I was like, no, I'm an airman. And they're like, no, you're not. You're a recruit. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. I got terribly scared. Um, but that's a development program. PG, you got anything on the development program and T3I? Uh, take advantage of it. Like, don't blow them off. Um, you know, some of the, these developers are regionally based, you know, so you may have somebody who's covering three states. Uh, like I know my, my Vegas developer, I call him my Vegas developer out here, but you know, he covers Utah, Nevada. So mainly your, your Reno and Vegas. And then he goes into Arizona as well. Like that's a lot of space to cover. Uh, I know that, uh, there was a recruiter out in Columbia, South Carolina. He was covering all the way up to Virginia and, and all the way through South Carolina. So that's a lot of space and they are traveling yeah. weekly. So you may only get one development session a month, but th here's where you, you make those connections in those development sessions with those folks. You hold each other accountable. You get on Discord. You find somebody who's in your area because all, all surround yourself with like-minded people that will hold you accountable and want to get after it. And it's only going to help your ch your uh, chances of of success. Absolutely, well said. So. We get through the development program and this can be a lot of times people will ask us, how long is it going to take? Well, that depends. It depends on a lot of different factors, right? There's multiple different ship dates during the year. You have a lot of hurdles that you actually have to clear. Just once you get through that initial map, so it doesn't mean that you're done being evaluated. They're going to continually evaluate you. You got to stay out of trouble. You got to stay doing the right thing while you're in the development program. Then you have to meet the physical standards. We already talked about it. It's already you know, the IFT standards is going to be, you know, back at the beginning here. But there's a lot of gates that you got to hit. So you can go anywhere from six months if you hit it on the quick. If you come in physically ready and you are 100 percent, you know, solidified in your life, your finances are in order. You're a perfect physical specimen. You can be out the door in six months. But if you have to, if you're not there physically, if you have things that you need to get in your personal life you know, squared away before you go, it can be 12 to 18 months, depending on when it is that you're ready. But this is a, it's a good thing, actually, because it's completely dependent upon you. You can affect how fast you ship by how well you do the things that the recruiters and the developers ask of you. So as always, you know, we're big fans of personal accountability here. Everything starts with you. So how long does it take to ship? That one's on you. So you tell me. Um, but it's not last minute anymore. It's or, or it's, not last yeah. minute. It's not a, hey, I showed up to a recruiter on Friday and all of a sudden by next Wednesday, I'm shipping. It, it's yeah. not like that. I um, shipped in two and a half months in 2001. Like I, I shipped like right away. Like I walked in, I said I wanted to be a PJ. It took them like a week and a half to get my pass test scheduled, which is what it was. I hit, I took my ASVAB, I hit my pass test. Uh, he got me into the program, took a little bit to get the paperwork in and I shipped less than a month after that. Yeah. I was gone. Yeah. Crazy, crazy time. All right. So that brings us to basic training, right? Um, you know, you've done everything that you need to do for the development program and you're going to get on a bus somewhere and end up at military city, USA, San Antonio, and you're going to go to joint base, San Antonio to report to basic training. So what are some, some handy, we, we did a whole do's and don'ts, um, you know, to be a good candidate and basic training was one of them. So maybe, I don't know how many cards I can put on YouTube, but yeah. it feels like I'm going to put a bunch of cards on here. So, um, we did a whole episode on this one too, but we get to basic training. You, rule number one for this, and I'll just open it with this is focus on basic training. 
a lot of times AF spec war candidates will get to basic and they're like, oh, you know, this is just, you know, kind of in my way before I get over to assessment selection. That is not true. That's the wrong attitude. I'm going to tell you right now, your checks are not signed by combat control. Your checks are not signed by pararescue. They're signed by the United States Air Force. So you got to go be a good airman first. So you're going to get to basic training and you're going to focus on basic. What do you got, Peach? Yeah. So you're going to learn all the ranks. You're going to learn marching as silly as it is. Um, you're going to learn all that, whether whether you're in a normal basic training flight or if you're in a special warfare training flight. Um, yep. And there are differences. And I know we're going to hit it here in a second or or you want me to just hit it now. Yeah, just hit it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Most likely you're going to be in an aspect war training right. flight, meaning everybody that shipped during that period is going to show up into a big flight and it's you're all going to have one of those four jobs it used to be when i went to basic training we didn't have that when i you know when peaches and i went to basic training you'd be in basic training with maintainers and intel folks and isr people and computer guys like it was a mishmash mm -hmm. you know security forces and it was a mismatch of, pe of uh, people and if you were lucky you had one or two i actually only had like one other person in my flight that was going to go try to be that knew that they were going to go in guaranteed to go uh pararescue right so i had one other person that i was like okay well we're going to go to indoc together and then he ended up getting set back for he got like a staff infection so then i didn't even have anybody like i was the yeah. only guy that ended up going over so that's not the way that we do things anymore we have entire flights of folks and there's a bunch of good things that come with that oh yeah extra sleep extra food extra training Mm -hmm. Right. Because, and, and they have, and I'm sure like, it's not like Aaron and I have gone through uh basic recently. Right. So I yeah. don't know if I don't Fun know fact, if we're not even allowed on that campus. Do you know how hard it is to just go observe oh, yeah. basic training? Yeah, Dude, it's, it's like locked down. Like I was, I randomly was like, Oh, I'd really like to check basic training out. They were like, Ooh, permanent party. Did you get approved by like your commander? I was like, yeah. what? No, I'm just in there. I, I can't go, go say hey to some folks. Like, I just want to go like observe, like, what are we doing? And they're like, Oh yeah, you, uh, you cannot do that. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, tight. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you what, when, uh, if, if you haven't been on Lackland and then you go on to see those enormous buildings brand new uh, dorms big, yeah. like if if you go in through and i don't even know what gate it's, it is it's like, the valley high gate yeah the, those those buildings the structures that are on the right hand side mm -hmm. those were our basic training that you and i yeah. went to that very now, first one on the right hand side was mine like yeah. the very first one like i was right oh and then the i was right over the the fence from cafe de Hilisco. And it was a delicious Mexican restaurant. Just wafting it in. During I could smell the huevos rancheros. And I always eat at that place. And I like as I'm eating at that place, I'm looking at my dorm that used to be <laughs> the 321st. Man, I'm so glad I'm not in there. Oh, but yeah, man. you go on there now and, you know, those buildings are still there. But they've these these structures that they have, they are like miniature cities. They're incredible. Mm -hmm. All the all your dining facilities are all built in. All the supplies built in. You're just like you're essentially there for your entire duration of base training. So it's yeah. pretty PT pretty pads awesome, are but, right outside yep. un underneath shade. It's pretty good. But pretty it's good. All, it's all important because you're you've got to learn the structure, the organization of the Air Force. You got to learn how all that works right off the bat because if not, you're going to be lost. And I'll I'll be the first one to tell you that I did not pay attention very well to the ranks and the 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 way that the Air Force organized. And I I been willing to bet that most people don't because you're just mm -hmm. so inundated with so much information. Again, I was 17 when I came in. I'm like, oh yeah, my God, yeah. what's going on here? I didn't have any ROTC experience beforehand or Rot or J ROTC or anything like that. So um like it was it was very new for me. Um but those are the things that you're going to learn. And mm -hmm. and again, I'm not a marching person, right? But you're going to learn how to march. You're going to learn how to dress right dress. You're going to learn how to put your uniform on correctly. All those things that you're going to use for the duration. And the whole point of it is to break you down, crush your ego, turn you, you know, essentially turn the person that you were into the person that we need you to be. Right. Yeah. And keep in mind, like we're all doing this for a purpose, right? So if there's anything that I'll tell you about basic training is you can say that you don't need to pay attention to basic training all you want, but the second that you get over to SWIC, and we're going to talk about that here in a second, the instructors are going to expect that you learned all of these things at basic training. They're going to hold you to account for those things. If you don't know rank, if you don't know basic stuff, like how to wear the uniform, you're going to march at SWIC. Like they are going to, and then it's not going to be like, oh, you know, you know, you're going to get yelled at. 
You're going you're to not get, gonna get the knife hand fix yourself. You're going to have a smoke session. You're going to get smoked. Uh, and and that is a cult. Is, and it's going yeah. to be your fault. It's going to be your fault, man. So if that, if anything <laughs> hits home <laughs> and I'll tell you what you're going to need for that, you're going to need to be hydrated. So beforehand, if you're thinking about going down, maybe go over to drinkhoist.com and check out uh, any one of their flavors. I'm a packet guy. If I was packing stuff to go down to basic training that I would get after I get out of basic training before I go over to Swick. I would want to open my bag and have some of those packets. I personally love the fruit punch. I love the little packets and the little powder. I've been a packet guy since the very beginning, but that's just me. So if you need any any extra hydration, maybe to take with you because it's a great travel product, just go to drinkhoist.com, put in the code ones ready, get yourself a sweet discount, have some of them packets ready to go. You'll look like a genius. Now you turned me into a packet guy. I was uh, ready yes. to drink one, which are which, which again, still are great, fire, but yeah. um. I was having problems traveling with it. So the packets are definitely where it's at. Um, you, that's a heat. Yeah. And, and, and while you're doing it, you should also check out uh, tackleet.com, yep. A T A C L E T E.com for all your equipment. I, I know that I just posted a couple of days ago that they had uh, the Alice Ruck, the infamous mm-hmm. Alice Ruck, the, the old infamous trusty. Alice. Yeah. Like, I mean, that. It's, it's a great ruck, but it's not just rucks. You can get that ruck there, you know, the kind of one that you're going to use in the pipeline. But at the same time, you've got fins, you've got the same uh, diameter and flexibility ropes that they're going to use in the pipeline so that you can learn how to tie knots. You can get mass snorkel, all that kind of good stuff from attacklate.com. Make sure you use the promo code ones ready for them to get yourself a discount. Nice. So basic training, we figured it out, right? You graduated. Hopefully you did so well that you got honor graduate and that you just absolutely crushed it. You got, I think you get like what, three, three ribbons or I guess two ribbons and a device out of basic if you're like shit hot. So I think you can get honor graduate if you're the best graduate that graduates there. And then you can shoot uh, expert in marksman. Yeah. You can get your marksman ribbons. And uh, I don't think they do pistol anymore over in uh over in basic, I think it's just long gone, but whatever. Man, but, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Again, 20, we're talking two decades. Doc. So we get out and now, now the fun begins. You're going to get yourself over to the special warfare candidate course. We have a whole episode on this. We've had multiple times. We had, I think like half of the coaching staff on at one point, we're going to have more of them on. So the point of the special warfare candidate course, it used to be called the prep course. And it's exactly what it sounds like. This entire team of strength and conditioning coaches and nutritionists and athletic trainers and physios and operators that work there are going to guide you through an eight week program to get you ready for assessment selection. At this time, officers are not going to SWIC. Enlisted folks to include cross trainees are going to SWIC. So at this time, everybody, if you're going to be a combat controller and that's what you're getting in to do. So keep in mind, we still haven't even talked about what it is, you know, how it is that you declare for your AFSC and stuff. Everybody's still in the SWOV program at this point. Everybody's going to go over to SWIC and you're going to report as one big unit, as one big pool of folks, TACP, SR, PJ, and combat controllers to include, you're going to have cross trainees. So you might have a staff sergeant, you might have a senior airman that did a different job and now they're showing up and they're going to start going through this eight week program and they treat everybody the same. Everybody gets into the the swing of how it is that we want you to perform inside of AFSPEC war. What are some of the, what are some of the benefits of the SWIC program? Well, I mean, it gets you prepped if, I mean, okay, so you have development that's going to get you prepped beforehand. Mm -hmm. There's, and then you have the special warfare BMT flights, right? I'm not saying that you're going to be able to keep the, I mean, maybe you are, but maybe you're not going to be able to keep the same level of fitness before you left for basic training through basic training and once you arrive at SWIC. So, and there's a whole litany of different skill sets that we're going to need you to have. So you have a bunch of experts that are writing programs for you. They're paying attention to what your limb facts are, your, your limiting factors in terms of where you're, you're weak at, where you're strong at, where you can improve. These are, these are professionals. You know, we've, ha- we've had them on your, your Nick's, your, your Emily's, your, Taylor starches, you're, you know, the mm. folks that know fitness and they are there for you. So just, just listen, you don't, I, I promise you, I'm sure there are some anomalies there, but you don't know better than they do because you they don't. have seen, they have so much data points going through that place that they know the trends. And then all of a sudden there's, you know, you're wondering why you've got shin splints or something like that, or why your grip strength is, is going and you're only able to get 15 pull-ups versus 21 or something like that, you know? Mm-hmm. So 
listen to them and focus on the programming. Absolutely. You want to trust the process. We harp on it all the time. The way that you can help yourself get ready for SWIC is start now by spending some time on your feet. That's the one thing, oh, yeah. you know, there's two things that they focus on a little bit more down at the special warfare candidate course. Peach has already hit on one of them being grip strength. Stent, spending time on your feet as much as you possibly can now is going to help you in SWIC because you are going to be shocked how tired you get at just bit, just at basic training by standing in formation for like four to six hours a day. You are going to be shocked how tired you are. And it's a cultural thing. It's a generational thing. The, the folks now, Peaches and my generation, this is just a, a certified fact. We spent more time on our feet. We spent more time out and about doing things than the generation that is getting ready to go to basic training right now. It's not a good or a bad thing. It is just a thing. So if you want to be successful and you want to allo- avoid lower musculoskeletal injuries, spend time on your feet. Yep. Start spend, Stand at your desk. Take some time. Go take a walk. If you want to, if you want to look on your phone, you want to doom scroll on your phone, do it standing. It sounds like the dumbest thing in the world. Stand, spend time on your feet. It will actually help you out. Um, and Swick focuses on that. But you have the phone right here. Like Kelly Sarrett <laughs> says, put the phone here <laughs> yep, and doom yeah. scroll if you're going to and do don't, it. Don't, don't hunch don't over. Do hunch and yeah, thing, yeah. You're going to get that nice like little little quado thing on your on your neck. Kyph- it's called kyphosis, bro. That's a medical term. Uh, I call it quado. So, <laughs> and, and for the folks that don't know who Quado is, just, just Google it. <laughs> just Google it. Just be careful. Careful where you're Googling from. So the SWIC program here, it's going to focus specifically on those things, right? Um, and get you ready for ANS. Now, it's time to talk about when do you actually get to say, I want to be a combat controller. And it happens in the Special Warfare Candidate course. So at some time, typically between week two and week four, I believe, of SWIC at this point, you are going to be able to to declare for your AFSC because there are going to be some people that come into AFSPEC war and they don't know exactly what they want to do. They know they want to go into AFSPEC war, but they're not sure what job. That's one of the great things about the SWOV program is that we can say, you want to be a special operator of some sort. We will help you figure it out along the way because we have time. You're going to get briefings from special operators. You're going to hear combat controllers tell you exactly from their perspective what it is that you do, what you have the the possibility to do, what are the requirements? And you'll hear that from all the four career fields, right? And now in between two and four weeks, you'll be able to raise your hand. Let's say you knew you wanted to be a controller from the very second that you figured out what a combat controller was, right? This is the time where you get to say, okay, I'm going to sign my name on this dotted line. When I get done with SWIC, when I've made all the requirements, I'm going to be assessed and selected for the combat control career field. So that is where that happens right here. There's one kind of closing gate to SWIC. There's one thing that you need to be prepared for. It's the candidate fitness test. We've already briefed that earlier and we already put the episode there, so we're not going to go into it. But it is your culminating event. You're going to go through a little bit of stress inoculation. They call it PRT, the physical readiness uh, physical readiness test or phase. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I've, we've talked about it before. We uh, so we're not gonna we're not gonna pull the curtain back on that one too much. But it is a test of your metal across a bunch of different modalities. So um, you will be one hundred percent prepared when you say, "Hey, I want to be a combat controller. I'm ready to be assessed and selected." And then once you pass those those specific gates, you will move on and you will graduate out of SWIC. Any save rounds for SWIC peaches? No, I I think if you were to look at any part of that and take one thing out that you're like, all right, out of that 11 minutes or whatever, we've been talking about that. The on your feet is the biggest thing. The rest will come, but be on your feet. Absolutely. Okay. And thank goodness that we thought ahead on this. You're going to graduate SWIC. You're going to get on a bus and you're going to go right over to the ANS course, the assessment and selection course. So if you're a combat control trainee, if you're a combat control candidate, you have raised your hand, you say, I want to be assessed and selected for combat control, and you report to the ANS building. It's a whole separate building. It's a whole separate area. It's separate cadre. It's not the same instructors. It's a whole different staff of folks that are going to start assessing and selecting you. There's always some in-processing or whatever, but from a 30,000-foot view, get it? That's a combat controller thing, 30,000-foot view, build the stack. So... Uh, we are going to start assessing you for attributes. We will put the attributes up here that we assess for. 
but and we've talked about it before but we're looking at things for grit determination leadership communication they're going to walk you through all of these things but what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the events and some of the expectations that you're going to see at ans so peaches why don't you hit us off with some expectations so baseline candidate expectations starting ans uh well i i've got to go in with the the see work do work kind of thing you see things that need to be done you do them you don't just like ask somebody else to take care of that I, mm -hmm. I got things I got to do. So that understanding your priorities of work, priorities of work are it is team gear first or communal gear first or communal tasks first and then your own stuff. It is it is a team event. And I understand that during ANS, it is like they are assessing each individual and each individual's characteristics. But it still says something about your team level of teamwork or level integrity. If you're just walking by a piece of trash or you're seeing somebody doing something that they probably shouldn't have and you, or, or maybe you see them because they're tired and they're sleep deprived and they're hungry and you see them kind of doing something that probably they shouldn't be doing and you don't help your buddy out. Like, Hey dude, come on over here. Let me, let me keep you in the, uh, the old circle here. Yeah. Um, you know, because that, there's some wild things that happen because you're tired, you're hungry, you've been grinding and, mm -hmm. and it just, sometimes your mind just kind of wanders and you just forget what you're doing. Exactly. Th this whole podcast, this whole project is focused on ANS. So we're not going to get into like very specific events or how to get through stuff. Here's what we're going to say. They're going to break you down to a point where you cannot hide your true self. They are going to physically tax you take away your sleep, take away your food, make you stress. They, they really want to see who you are as a person. They, they make it as objective as possible. You are literally assigned a number and you are that number. Half the time, the cadre don't know if you're an NCO or if you're an officer. This is, you know, when the officers are going to join you, by the way. So now you'll have lieutenants and sometimes junior captains that are going to come over for ANS. So they want to see how you operate and who you are as a person. And it's tough. It's going to be the biggest test of your life. And the attrition rate is still very high. I'm not going to put a number out there because that's how you that's how you get in trouble with folks is, you know, you, you say a number and it's too high or too low. So it's still hard is what, what I'm going to say here. Um, and there's unfortunately the, the highest rate of attrition here. Um, what happens if you quit? Peaches, if you decide that you have a moment of weakness and you self initiate your own elimination or SIE and you quit, what are the options there? Uh, well, if it, if it's an SIE and you, you know, you, you all were all around had good attributes, you know, there were no uh, mainly like, let's talk about integrity. That's, that's really the biggest thing, right? Um, if there's no integrity issues and stuff like that, and you were overall good, you could get a chance to return later on in your career, uh, mm -hmm. later on in your enlistment. That is not a guarantee though. Um, the the other aspect of it is you're gonna have to find a new job you know yeah. now maybe that is something that is still within the bounds of something that you would want to do the the other aspect is maybe you end up doing something that you absolutely don't want to do you know mm -hmm. and and i don't want to mention any afscs because i don't want to make it sound like we are you know downplaying those or anything sure. like that but you you will find a new job in the air force now Hopefully your 125 alpha, which is essentially kind of like your, your training report that says whether or not you can come back. Um, hopefully it says that you can, and then you can, you know, go through the process of cross training and, and that kind of stuff. But if, if you're a turd, like, you know, or you've had integrity issues, like, you, yeah. I'm sorry, you're just not somebody that we want. Yep. And it sucks. But the bottom line here is always don't quit. Yeah. Don't quit. You don't have to worry about it. That's not the point. Not quitting is is not like some superhuman task. It's the expectation. The expectation is you're not going to quit. You've you've spent a year or maybe even more than that of your life to get to that point. So don't do it. Number one. All right. So another option that could happen inside of ANS is what happens if you don't get selected. So let's say you don't quit, but you get all the way to the end. And unfortunately, because of the attributes, I'll put the attributes out here too, because Peaches was nice enough to put them in the note, but communication, drive, integrity, physical fitness, problem solving, stress tolerance, teamwork, and trainability. That's the framework that the instructors, and we're talking about psychologists, we're talking about special operators, we're talking about 
you know, family life counselors, there are people with eyes on you from a bunch of different angles. There is a possibility where you don't quit, you make it through all the physical stuff. And unfortunately, you don't get selected because you don't meet the gate for one or more of those attributes. And that is to that is a possibility that you can go ahead and get through the course. However, not get selected. All of the other things that Peach has said just now for quitting apply to not getting selected. So we're not going to rehash them. You're going to get another job. You're going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. Peach has, you know, crushed it. What I will say for the for the mental aspect of this Peach is, is if somebody goes through, they don't quit but they don't get selected. What advice would you have for them as they're leaving a and I'd say fail fast. Like don't dwell on it. And I know that that's easy for me to say being on this side of the fence, like, cause I would, I would probably dwell on it and it would hurt. Um, but understand like somebody saw something that, you know, whatever it is, maybe you weren't quite there. Maybe it was a maturity level and, you know, a year or two of maturity within the air force, uh, of not just experience the air force, but experiencing life will help you get to where you need to be. So don't dwell on it. Don't think you're any less of a person because you're not, right. but focus, like, uh, focus on learning your new job, focusing on being the best airman NCO that you could possibly be. Um, keep your nose clean and then come back, come yeah. back and try out. Absolutely. And I would say as any, my only piece of advice as you're leaving and as you, you know, it, it's going to suck to hear that you didn't get selected. It's going to suck to hear that you were physically prepared and you made it put your ego aside just for one second and ask why really yeah. ask them what, what did you see? Was it a mental thing? Was I not physically fit enough? Was I not a good team player? Please tell me why they will tell you, they will give you good feedback on your exit interview, ask, internalize it, and then make it better and then make it better. All right. Option number three out of A and S. Okay. You said you wanted to be a combat control trainee. You said you wanted to be a controller for the rest of your career. You go through assessment selection, you get selected but there's a possibility that you don't get selected for combat control. There's a couple reasons that this could happen, but it's all hinging on performance. So imagine that we only have five slots for combat control and we have 20 people that want to be combat controllers. Only the top five are going to get that job. There is a possibility that exists that you could get selected, but not for combat control. What you got on that one, Peaches? Actually, dude, you you dropped out, so I didn't actually hear what question you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I so got I'm it. sitting here going like, Stupid. man, I, I really hope you keep going and keep going because I don't know. <laughs> I don't ask me a question because I can't hear Until it. Until he catches <laughs> I got you. I got you. So yeah, it is uh, the getting selected, but not for your job. Like there's the possibility that you get through it, you get selected, but there's not enough spots. Right. And I gave the example of we've got 20 spots for combat control. Okay. Or, I'm sorry, five spots for combat control, but only, you know, 20 people make it through for combat control. So it's performance based 100%. If you, yep. if you perform, if you were the top candidate and it doesn't matter, you're going to get your job. If you were the 10th candidate and we only have seven spots, now you're in trouble and there's a possibility that you could get selected. We put it in here as an option. It's really not that that common. No. It, it just really isn't because, again, we have problems getting our slots every year. We have problems getting an, like 100% of the career fields every year. So there is a possibility that this could happen. But we're going to put a bow on this one and we're just going to say, hey, go perform. Be yeah. undeniable. Make sure that there is no question in anybody's mind that not only are you the candidate that they need, but you're the combat control candidate that they need. And you can completely avoid this option. And and just last little thing. Uh, and, and I think Colonel Schindler had actually covered this, but it's it the the selection rate for the job that you want, not the not the overall attrition rate, but the selection mm -hmm. rate for the job you want. I want to say he said it was like 99.6. It's so high. Yeah. percent get exactly what they want. So, right. because guess what? All four of the AFSCs are undermanned. So critically undermanned all the time. Yeah, exactly. All right. So man, we're going to go with the best possible option here to get us to our next sort of a, our next sort of area. And it's, you got selected. You wanted to be a combat controller. You crushed ANS. You had all those attributes that we talked about. Bam, you got selected. Your next step is going to be pre-dive. Okay. So ANS and pre-dive are two separate courses. 
And this is going to get our first point here is I want people to focus on the two separate courses. A lot of times people will email, text, DM, and they'll say, I'm really having problems with these underwater exercises. I'm having problems with my underwaters. I'm having problems tying knots. I'm having problems with this. And our first question is, why are you focusing on anything other than assessment and selection? Because pre-dive is a separate course other than assessment and selection. There are some water events, spoiler alert, that are going to happen inside of assessment and selection. But a lot of those skill type events, that is a specific pre-dive course. So you need to be specific when you're preparing yourself for the pipeline. You need to focus on A&S, and then you're just going to have to trust the process that in SWIC, they're going to give you the tools to get through A&S, and they're going to give you the tools or at least a baseline to be successful in pre-dive as well. I'm not saying go, don't go in blind, and I'm not saying you know don't ever do a single water event in your training, but pre-dive is its own specific four-week course that's going to get you ready for dive school. It is not easy, but I will tell you that uh, the the mindset shift that they have is amazing. And from talking to teams that go through it and seeing the curriculum down there, they treat you a little bit differently. They're there to train. It's extremely hard, but they don't need to induce stress. You're going to induce enough stress on yourself being underwater and, and doing water con drills and stuff like that. They don't need to just absolutely hammer you every single day. They're there to do a job. They're there to get some work done. And if your team is just there to be a professional team that wants to do work, this is not going to be that big of a deal. So I would just say, don't, don't focus on this pre-dive stuff when you're in the development program and, and whatever else. And then when you get there, if they're going to let you be a grown up team and let you do work like professionals, holy cow, lean into that. Be a professional, be a professional at your job. Go there, do work, have the right gear, put out, and pre-dive is going to be a breeze. Yep. And and it really just sets you up. I mean, I don't I don't know that how much we want to dwell on on uh or not dwell, but dive in on pre-dive, but like it, it there's a reason for pre-dive. It is not just to crush your soul, even though right. it will crush your soul. It but will. it's it's helping you prepare for dive school. Mm -hmm. I mean that that is the whole point. And and I want to take a just if you guys haven't noticed, like everything is a building block here. We try and get you a foundation before you even enter basic training. We solidify that foundation during basic training. Then we add on top of that during SWIC. Then ANS is not a building block at all. That is a way to test the foundation of, or yeah, I, I guess it is a way to test the foundation that was built, right? So, um, and then your pre-dive is another building block for dive school. And it all adds up until you find yourself on team. But guess what? Once you're on team at a squadron, you're not done yet either. So you're not. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. What you, what you thought was this, uh, you know, strong foundation in this big house that you've built. Yeah. It turns out it wasn't. <laughs> it's a <laughs> condo. Gonna, it's a little <laughs> condo. It's a little starter house. It's real fixer upper. Um, so we get through pre-dive and then it's all set up like Peaches was saying, we're going to go to dive school. This is going to be the first time that you get to go off campus. This is going to be awesome. You get to go to Panama City, Florida. You get to go to the Air Force's own dive school. You're going to be there with a team of folks that you just graduated with, that you've got these bonds. You're going to meet uh, you know, some number. There's going to be people that are, are going to show up to that dive school that are not necessarily on your team. Like It's not just your team. You're going to have other folks show up maybe some setbacks, maybe some other folks, and you get to go to dive school, which is awesome. So it's about six weeks long. You're going to learn open and closed circuit techniques. We have talked about dive school before, so we're not going to go too far into it. But, uh, you know, dive school, we, the combat controller pipeline has gone back and forth on where they put dive school. You know, you used to go through a completely different process, which I'm not even going to muddy the waters right now. You used yeah, to go do a, yeah, it's too much. It's a whole episode on itself. Um, so you used to go through a different process and they would put it at a different part of the pipeline and the combat control career field has gone back and forth on where do we put it? It's been standardized. Now you go through this process, basic SWIC, ANS pre-dive, and then right to CDC, right to the combat dive school. And everybody does the same thing. Everybody that's going to go and be a diver. It's fantastic. It's exactly the way to, in my opinion, the way to do it. Um, and you're seeing great results. People ask how often you fail out of dive school. The attrition rate for our dive school isn't that high because our pre-dive program is so good. 
at yep. preparing you for the rigors of dive school. It still does happen. It's still hard. Uh, those events are, are not easy, especially like the big, the big exercise at dive school is one man comp, one man compensation drill. I'm not going to talk about it. I failed it once. I was on my last shot. I had to refire that bad boy. It is not easy. Um, however, you feel really good getting that dive bubble. And this is the first badge you're going to get as well. So as you get out of dive school, it's going to be the first time in your career that you get a little extra chest candy to throw up on there and have people look at you weird. You know, when you walk into a chow hall as a, as a slick sleeve airman and you somehow have a dive bubble, people are like, what is that? <laughs> so it's great. So uh, anything on dive? No, uh, in, enjoy it though. And it's not, um, you know, there are limited seats, right? Mm -hmm. So there, you, you may not find yourself at Panama city. You may mm -hmm. find yourself at the army dive school in Key West, Florida. Like you may, it's, it's never, there are still folks that go there. It's just, it's just kind of rare because we have our own school now. Yep. So, but either, yeah. either way, um, I, I don't know. I, I like that we have our own school at the same time. Like I think the joint aspect of it, of going to, to the army side is, is pretty cool too. Yeah. I don't disagree with that. I agree. All right. So this is a big question that we get all the time. So that one of the big questions is, you know, I have a family. I'm going into the pipeline. When does my family get to join me? We're going to say it here because this is the first time that you're going to be able to have your family join you. After you get out of CDC, depending on the phase, and it depends on kind of what your school schedule looks like. So it's not standardized. This is going to depend on a couple of different factors, right? But this is the first time where your family is going to be able to join you. So if you have a family, if you have a spouse that you're married to, or if you have children, this is how you're going to prepare them, right? So this is how you're going to say, okay, I need to get through basic, SWIC, ANS, pre-dive, and dive. And that is the timeline. Like that's the minimum amount that you're going to be away. So if we're doing, if we're doing math in public here, basic okay. training is about two months, right? It's about eight weeks. SWIC is another two months. So that gets us to four. ANS is another month. That gets us to five. SWIC, I'm sorry, pre-dive is another one. That gets us to uh, four months total or four months total or five We're months, total. five months now, five months total. Okay. So five months total plus dive, which is another a month and a half. So we're talking like six and a half, seven months that you are going to have to maintain that relationship and maintain your family. And then that's the earliest that that can possibly happen. So at a minimum, eight months is probably how much you're going to spend on the road. Now, it doesn't mean you don't get to see him and you're going to be completely cut off. You're, you're going to have your phone. You're going to be able to talk to them. They're going to be able to come down for limited engagements. There's going to be times, especially depending on when the pipeline is like, you're going to get to go home for Christmas. There's going to be points where you're granted leave, especially if there's time in between schools, which happens frequently, you're going to have leave. They can come down and see you. They'll be there for graduations. They'll be there for leave periods. But for those that are married coming into the pipeline or those with families, after you graduate CDC is the first time that your family is going to be able to be PCS. So a permanent change of station, meaning they'll move your family from where they are to you. And then you will live with that family for the remainder of your pipeline. Okay. Yep. So fre frequently asked question, we wanted to put it out there. Um, typically at this point too, because we're going to start talking about these other schools and, and kind of give you a breakdown. But the question is, how long do I spend in between schools? And then kind of like, what do I do? Oh, well, what geez. do you do is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, so that's I know. a loaded question. It really is. So in between schools, it depends. So we, we typically say it takes anywhere from 18 to 24 months to get through the pipeline. That's with the assumption that the schools have a spot for you, that you don't get injured, that there aren't people ahead of you. There was this crazy thing that happened like 2020 to 2022. I, what was it called? Oh yeah. COVID that shut schools down. Like we can't, we don't have any control over that. You know, sometimes there are budgetary issues and the government has a pause in their operations. Like we can't forecast that. So, you know, there is the distinct possibility that you could be stuck at a, a waiting on a school for a month or so. Right. Uh, what do you do in the meantime is you stay sharp, you stay physically fit, you prepare for that next school and you stay out of trouble. It's pretty much that's eat, sleep, recover, train, and stay out of trouble. That's yeah. as clean as I can make it. And just repeat that over and over. Day to day, day, day. To day baby. <laughs> You're going to be kind, like, look, I, I like to look at it from the bright side. I almost look at it like a deployment, right? Later in your life, you're going to have deployments where guess what you do? You eat, you sleep, you go op, then you come back, you reset, and you do the same thing. 
for six to eight months at a time. And sometimes it's terrifying every day. And sometimes it's the longest stretch of doing nothing. And you're, you're literally trying to just stay out of trouble and doing it. And why do we keep saying stay out of trouble? It's almost like people <laughs> with idle hands, like folks like us that have idle hands just almost can't help themselves because um, it's so. because we're the worst when yeah. people, I, I said this actually when somebody asked me what being an NCOIC of a, you know, an, an indoc team was like, um, or, you know, being an NCOIC of a, you know, any, any of these guys. And I was like, well, it's like, it's like herding cats, except the cats are blind, deaf, superhuman and mischievous. Yes. That's what it's like. And cause that's how we all are. Yeah. Um, there we go. So enough of that. So, Sear, Airborne, some of these other cooler schools, uh, free fall. After CDC, this gets kind of wonky because really now you're just getting in where you fit in. We have people that manage the entire pipeline, right? And they're looking at getting you as a combat control trainee to all of these other schools that you're going to need for your pipeline. So the order may vary, but you're going to go to Sear. That's three weeks. That's it, Fairchild. I love Sear. I think it's one of the best it's courses I've, I've ever been to. It's awesome. The Sear instructors are great, super professional. You're going to learn stuff that you never knew. It's awesome. Really interesting. Airborne, uh, not so interesting. The Army, we've done an Airborne episode, so I'll happy to put another. Uh, I'll be happy to put another card here on the Airborne yeah. episode. It's essentially five days of training packed into three weeks worth of time. It hasn't changed since 1947. Uh, trucks fall out of airplanes on a static line all the time and are just fine. You'll be great. Keep your feet and knees together. Enjoy Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, MFF, this is a fun one. So this is really, really good. There are some, uh, there are some issues with delay because MFF is a, is a low density, high demand school, meaning there's a bunch of folks in all four services trying to go to the free fall school. We aren't the only game in town, right? It's the army school. Uh, the Navy also has a course. Um, you know, there are some other courses that you can possibly get to. We're trying to fix it. Um, but look on the bright side, you're going to go skydiving as part of your job, right? Get paid for it. Pay for it, baby. Uh, three weeks at, at uh, you know, army airborne. It's four weeks at military free fall, right? So in some order, you're going to hit all of these things and then you're going to get ready. And by the way, you're still at joint base San Antonio. So this is kind of like a weird thing, right? But there's a bunch of different squadrons that own you. The new process is as a combat control trainee, you are going to be owned by the 350th special warfare training squadron. So SWTS, that is going to be essentially your dad command. Your dad is the squadron that owns you. And you're going to go TDY to all of these schools. It used to work differently. I'm just telling you now, that's what it is. They're going to own you this entire pipeline. It actually helps out a lot. It helps out for a lot of different reasons. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Peaches, because we're talking about something I have no idea about. But your next stop after all these other schools, right? CDC, Airborne, Dive, MFF, SEER, all of this stuff, you're going to get, I said CDC and dive because I'm stupid. Sorry. That's all right. um, yeah, it is what it is. So now we're going to show up and you're start. You're going to get into the meat and potatoes of what you're going to do as a combat controller and it's air traffic control school. So hit us off with that, especially start off with the biggest change that we've seen in ATC in the last couple of years. And that's location. Uh, yeah. So ATC or air traffic control school used to be at Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi. It has now moved. It moved a couple of years ago to Fort Bragg, or I think, I think Fort Bragg has a new name now, but anyway, it's Fort, at Liberty. Fort Bragg, Fort Liberty, Fort Liberty, um, you know, Pope Army Airfield right there at the combat control school. So, um, we actually have air traffic control, you know, rated air traffic controllers that our instructors that come and they teach our combat control students all the, all the, the inner workings of air traffic control uh, to make them better. So that's, that's what it is. It, I, what I would, I don't want to say it's not hard, you know, cause everybody has different things. So it is problem solving at a level of a 3d picture, right? So sometimes you can see the aircraft where they're at. Sometimes you can't. Um, they're at different altitudes, they're at different speeds, there's different size aircrafts. There are, um, you know, so, so with that speed altitude difference, you know, and now you have aircraft that are going faster and pass each other. Like it's, it's a puzzle, but it's, it's very manageable. 
Uh, and I say that fully knowing that I met a guy two weeks ago that was like, yeah, I'm a ATC washout. And I was like, Oh, mm-hmm. okay. You know, cause he was asking me questions, but I was like, ah, oh, it's not bad. Like whatever, it's, you know, but, uh, I, it was, it was awkward. I was like, Ooh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, you know, but, it, but it wasn't the same kind of training. He went to normal air travel control school. Um, not the one at combat control school. So air travel control encompasses a whole bunch of things. It, it, it's the folks in the tower, right? So you've got three different positions up in the tower that are being held, but it's also radar. So the, the folks that you see in the dark room that have the, you know, the big radar thing, mm-hmm. that's the RAPCON or radar. Like we don't do that stuff anymore. If we used to, we don't. That's what he happened to fail. To me, that is a more difficult problem set or a skill set to try and solve than it is being up in the tower, which is the training that we get. Yep. But make no mistake, this is going to be your first real academic challenge. So the pipeline mm-hmm. is not all physical. We're not just looking for people that can do push ups, sit ups, flutter kicks, and look good with their shirt off. Like this is your first academic challenge. You're going to have to bu- buckle down. And oh, by the way, you're not going to be able to slip on your physicality either. You're mm-hmm. still going to train hard. You're still going to stay in great shape. You're going to be under the watchful eye of combat control NCOs and STOs out there at Fort Bragg. Like you're going to have eyes on you 24 seven and you're going to be expected to perform. So get ready for it. Get out of ATC and then get ready for your finishing school. So you're going to get ready to go to your apprentice course. And that's combat control school out at Fort Bragg. So Peach, yeah. you know, the first, the first note that I have here is, you know, you're going to start putting all your skills together. What does that look like at CCS? So that is a mixture of small unit tactics or what we call SMUT. That is your shoot, move, communicate. That is, that is taking all the skills that you have, that you have gained from, um, even, even a basic level of, of teamwork, integrity and all that kind of stuff that you learned at SWIC, ANS, um, pre-dive. Airborne seer free fall and you're putting it all together and learning airfield stuff. Um, not, not just, you know, how to do air traffic control on an airfield, but you're learning how to market. You're learning how to do surveys of drop zones and landing zones, how the inner workings of all that. And wh- why is it important to know the glide slope of a C 130 and a C 17 when it comes to doing surveys? Like all those things, like why am I marking the airfield this way? It makes no sense until you actually do it and then you see you know a 130 a, a real aircraft landing. land right yeah coming in and, and you're talking to it it's it's you know during this whole time you're either talking you know it's it's me talking to to you like okay well you're you know mobile 41 heavy you know kind of, like none of that it right it is you are actually talking to real planes and there is actual safety of flight concerns you you mm-hmm. have to make sure the lz is suitable you have to make sure it's marked correctly you have to make sure that you are deconflicting aircraft so that you're not running them into each other so the stakes are now higher um and you're putting all that stuff together and a lot of the things like at least for me um cuz i'm slower these little pieces, I could never connect them together until combat control school. And once we got out on the airfield or we started doing things together, we started shoot, move, communicate out in the woods, doing land navigation and that kind of stuff. Once I was able to put all those things together, things just kind of clicked and made sense. Like, Oh, this is why the instructors were saying that this is Mm -hmm. why they had us do that. Before that, it was just kind of like, "I, I don't understand why we're doing this, but to your point, you trust the process. Because we are doing it for a reason. The instructors in the cadre are doing the programming, telling you things, giving you extra, extra training for a reason. And it's for, and it all comes together during combat control school or, you know, pararescue apprentice course, like all those things. And this is, this happens in BUDS, Q course, Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. There's, again, it's building blocks. Yeah. Man, you got me motivated. It makes me want to go. To, makes me want to go to old Fort Liberty and report. <laughs> uh, so, and, it, and I, I just want to highlight something here. Like Peach has hit it already, but up until now, up until CCS in the pipeline, the only person that you could really like kill with your actions is pretty much yourself, right? Like if you're not good at free fall, if you're if you do a, a dive procedure incorrectly, if you do you know something silly that you, you know you put yourself at risk. I want to hit this one home. This is the first time that if you do something wrong, you could seriously injure or kill somebody else or cause a class A mishap of an aircraft. And that's no kidding. It's on you. So this CCS is game time. So the risk is high for you. You have to perform. You still have to maintain those standards. Like Peaches was saying, 
once you once you achieve a standard and it starts in basic training hell it starts all the way in the development program once you've shown that you can maintain a standard that standard doesn't go away you're expected to maintain that standard the entire time once you know what integrity looks like in basic training you're expected to maintain that level of integrity the entire time once you figure it you know once you pass a pt test at a certain level you're supposed to maintain that level the entire time and it goes you know all the way up so you know this is definitely game time the risk to you is, is big you're still going to be evaluated personally um, and you're going to be evaluated as part of a team as part of a larger small uh, special operations team but at the end of ccs you get your beret and that is a culminating event for a lot of yep. people you know that scarlet beret has been in your sights for the entire time and it gets weird because as you get closer like you're like oh man like is it too early to buy my beret, but I want to shape it. But if anybody sees me with it, they're going to smoke me for it. And, oh, you yeah. know, you're, you're getting real. It's almost like a no hitter in pitching or in, you know, baseball, you, you know, you don't, you don't want to talk to the pitcher. You don't want to talk about it. Like, you know, you're weeks away from graduation, then you're days away. What was it like when you donned that beret for the first time peaches? It's a, an incredible feeling of accomplishment and you really do feel like Superman. Like you can, like, you can take on the world and and in reality with those group of folks that that you are donning your beret with you really can you, you can really take can. on the world and man and that's a that's great it, it's you know sure it's arrogant it's egotistical but it's reality we have assessed and selected you and trained you to a certain level and we expect you to go out and do the nation's work from there now once you get the team like there's additional training and, you know, advanced training that you're going to have to do. Um, and, and I know we're going to talk about STTS next, but like, again, you've never made it, but this feeling of putting your beret on is fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's so, and, and it motivates me to this day. Anytime I see on Instagram, I see a class graduate and I hear that, you know, blouse your boots, don your beret, you know, say the creed, say the code, man, I'll tell you what, like you can't help but connect to that. You can't help to be transported back to that time. You know, I remember he's a, he's a crow now. Uh, his first name's Dan. He works up in Alaska. Dan and I went through almost our entire pipeline together. I remember one thing very, very clearly about our graduation. And it says we just screamed the pararescue motto, scream the code that ends with that others may live. You know, Dan and I turned to each other and we gave each other a huge hug. Like we'd been through a ton together, good and bad. And I just, I always remember that time and I can't help but be transported when I see folks achieve that two year goal of putting that beret on their head. Like, like I love, we just had a, a combat control school graduate. I saw that video and I was like, damn, that's what it's about right there. Cause you, and that was well said, yep. you can take on the world with those dudes. Um, but we're not done. You, really can. you ain't done there, baby. Um, you're going to get with those guys and now to, to who much is given, much is, uh, much is expected, and, and that's going to continue right here. You're going to take a short break. You're going to be proud of yourself for a moment, but then it's time to put that in a box, and then you're going to report to STTS. So the Special Tactics Training Squadron is its own advanced training squadron meant to take you to the next level. We've talked about skill levels in the Air Force before. I'm going to make it as clean as possible. You don't need to know all the skill levels. When you graduate CCS, you are an apprentice. You are a three skill level. STTS is meant to take you from three to five skill level, which is the next skill level up. You're a journeyman. Okay. So that's what it's called. It, don't get too wrapped up in it. The point is, is that STTS is going to be designed to make, give you advanced skills and advanced tactics, techniques, and procedures in order to prepare you for your first unit. Okay. STTS is awesome. It's, it's again, it's at a different location. It's at Hurlburt field, Florida. It has a different staff of folks. You're going to be going again, TDY from joint base, San Antonio and Lackland or, uh, we used to be called Lackland, but San Antonio, Texas, you're going to be going down to STTS to finish this course. I believe it's six months long. I should have done research on this, but I think it's six months. Is it not? Around there, go back through just because they have recently, um, like the when I talked to the chief that was there last, and actually we had Colonel Walsh on, um, they were in the in the process of rewriting syllabus, so I don't right. know one hundred percent what they table slapped on. Okay, right. So we'll do we'll do a little bit of research, and I'll see if I can't find it real quick here. But 
PJ, is just kind of talk about the nuts and bolts of STTS and, and you know, really kind of uh, explain what it is that these young combat controllers are going to uh, be expected to do. Yeah, so uh, Special Tactics Squadron or uh, Special Tactics Training Squadron, STTS, uh, as out at Herbert Field, you're going to learn. So when, when I talked about combat control school in terms of putting all those skills together, yes, those are your fundamental skills and they're, they're great and you need them to have the baseline level of shoot, move, communicate, um, airfield, that kind of stuff. But now's the chance where you're actually going to increase those full mission profiles, um, which are, when I say for full mission profiles, you can call them field training exercises. You can call them, you know, where you're going to integrate with the AC-130, CV-22s to go, you know, helo assault force into an objective, learn how to do some of the CQB, um, maybe some call for fire, maybe some joint terminal attack control kind of aspects. You're not a joint terminal attack controller, right, uh, qualified, but you can still, as a combat controller, you can still do uh, call for fire and that kind of stuff. So you're going to learn all of that. This is also where you're going to integrate with some of your special tactics PJs that are mm-hmm. coming into special to uh, STTS to join you. So you're going, there's TAC P's as well that have come from a normal ASOS that have now been selected to be in special tactics. So you're going to get a chance to integrate with all the other AFSCs and really learn the job even more. And it's, it's a great time. One, great location. Two, great training that is all set up for you. Like yep. all, everything that they do is for you. It's an awesome campus. You got an awesome gym. You got an awesome staff that are there to support you. Now, that doesn't mean you get arrogant and go, hey, what the hell, man? You're here to support me. No, that's mm-hmm. not the way it works. Um, <laughs> you still got to put in the work. But uh, yeah, great opportunity. The whole The whole fact that we have... STTS is a phenomenal thing. Yeah. The great thing about this too, is it's really your first experience. You actually, you, you have a beret now, right? You haven't fully made it. The line is still a little bit blurry between student and like real boy. If you want to put it like that, like you're not quite, you're still kind of Pinocchio, but this one, really the instructors are looking at you and they expect you to perform. Like they expect you to act like a combat controller. You're going to be there with PJs that are, you know, around the same skill level, but those PJs have already been in a unit. A lot of times the PJs have been in a unit for a little bit of time before they got a seat into STTS and um, special reconnaissance will actually go to STTS directly out of school as well. Um, However, the PJs have been there for a little while. The instructors are happy to let you act as an adult and just train. So the term gentleman's course gets thrown around or maybe, you know, big boy rules. But if you show up, just like we said in dive and in the building block thing, if you've noticed the single thread through this entire thing is building blocks the entire way, you got a little bit of taste of it at pre-dive. You got a little bit more of a taste of it at CCS. If you're a high performing team, the instructors are not going to smoke you and screw with you all day. Now, I like nothing more than, as an instructor than having a team that's like, hey, these these folks are here and they mean business. They're on time. Mm-hmm. They brought their gear. I'm, I'll tell you what, you want to you want to get the best training that you can possibly get. If you do what you're supposed to, those instructors, they'll teach you 10 times more than what the curriculum says. We have to teach you the curriculum. If we get to teach you more stuff, do we're going. And yeah. as TTS, you have the distinct possibility to really step on the gas. And one of those things that we've put back in STTS now is full mission profiles. Can you kind of talk about what those full mission profiles look like? Yeah, so that's from almost a, a mission that's cradle to grave, right? You receive... You know, we, we talked about the troop leading procedures, you know, receipt a mission, right? Mm-hmm. That is where you're integrating all of that. Um, so your troop leading procedures, your MDMP, your mission, uh, military decision making process, um, that you have some professionals that are teaching you that kind of stuff. So receipt a mission, then you're going to work through all that and, and they're going to, um, you're going to get your turn at being mm-hmm. the team leader or the person in charge, whatever that contract looks like. Uh, so you're going to get a chance to lead that. Uh, you're also going to get multiple chances to learn how to follow, which is equally as important. Mm-hmm. But receive a mission, you're going to do the mission planning, and then you're going to execute. And that is, again, whether it's a helo assault force, a ground assault force, maybe it's a dive mission, maybe it's an over-the-horizon boat movement. Um, 
It could be a jump in. It could be free fall mission, clearing right. team onto an airfield, right? It, it could be a whole bunch of different things um, that is going to be based around a syllabus, but you're not, it should be transparent to you on that front, mm -hmm. but they are trying to get you to a level that you have never seen before. And there, sometimes you're going to be uncomfortable. Sometimes you're not, but it is there to train you. So yep. you, you, you infill by whatever means that is, you execute the objective, whatever that happens to be, and then you got to exfil. So from cradle to grave, it's, it's mission planning, infill, execution, exfil, and then you have also have the debrief. So those are yep. all things that you're going to have to focus on or not focus on, but you're going to have to do in order to be successful during those training evolutions. And this is really the first time where everything's real. You're, you're not mm -hmm. talking to an instructor on a radio pretending to be a C-130. When you're doing your mission planning, the C-130 pilot is going to be in the room. A lot of times in CCS, yep. you know, you'll be like, well, if we have a mass casualty, I would talk to the PJ and I would get him to do it. Well, now you're going to be able to be like, hey, uh, PJ, you're an actual PJ. What, what are we going to do if we take a hit yep. on this airfield or where are we going to put the CCP? You're going to actually be talking to these folks. You're going to have, you know, you're going to have a jump master. You're going to go on a real plane. You're going to have the helicopter crews in mission planning with you. You're going to be talking real time to these people. And it, it's all the way up to moulaging patients to make them look like they're injured, to having people that are no kidding, aggressing against you. Like people that are trying to kill you with, you know, simulated rounds, or they're trying to shoot blanks at you or trying to use, you know, miles gear, whatever it is that we have, you know, in, in that time and context, yep. it's, it's a, it's a real full speed rehearsal. And man, I, I distinctly remember going on some of my first mission profiles and just going like, holy cow, like I actually feel like a PJ right now. I feel like a combat controller and STTS. That's the feedback that we got. Um, yep. from those students coming out of there with these FMPs is like, man, I felt like I was part of the team. I felt like I was really doing the job and, you know, it was very, very rewarding and not only for the students, but for the staff, because when you watch a team plan a mission from cradle to grave, all five, you know, paragraphs of the operation and they get all the way through execution and they crush it. You're like, man, these career, we're going to be okay. Yeah. We're ST, be right. ST is going to be okay because you, you watch a team, prefer, you, you know, I, Going home after a night where you watch a team just absolutely destroy it on a on a full mission profile and just crush it, you're like, all right, cool. You know, yep. this means something. That's awesome. Yeah, exactly. And that's it. That's the CCT pipeline. You go out of here, you go to your first unit, you're not done. You're gonna continue going on. You're gonna get that JTAC qual at your first unit. That's the first thing that you're gonna do, and, and you're gonna go on with your life from there. But that's a deep dive all the way from pre-accession, all the way through the, the combat control pipeline, getting your beret, getting out of STTS and getting to your first unit. Peaches, what do you got for wrap up, bud? A couple things that, that really want to hit. Stay on your feet, like, cause you're going to have a lot of time on your feet. Um, integrity, right? Have that integrity. Priorities of work, team gear before your own, right? see work, do work and trust the process. Uh, and I guess a little add on to that would be don't compare yourself. But like, those are the things that I really think is, I guess the keys to success, which are, are a lot. They're not easy. They're challenging. Sometimes you fail at them. Sometimes you're very, very successful at them, but that's the reality. At the end of this video, I'll go ahead and link to be a good dude and put out. That's the only, only advice I got because it's the best piece of non-advice we give everybody. Hey, thanks y'all for uh, following along on this one. It was a lot of information packed into kind of a short amount of time, but we appreciate it. Hopefully we answered some of your questions and that's the most up-to-date information we could possibly get for you. As of the context right now, we'll quick turn this one, but that is exactly what you're gonna be going through. We helped you uh, prepare essentially for the pipeline. We'll get you the link to the Discord. We'll make sure to put everything in the comment section so that you can see exactly where you go to get any one of these processes complete. But thanks for following on from the Ones Ready team. Trent is off being a special reconnaissance guy somewhere. We don't know what he does, but from Peaches and myself, thanks for following along. Make sure to go over to onesready.com. We got a lot of stuff on the horizon. Follow us on Instagram, leave a, leave a comment, just absolutely caress that subscribe button and then just smash the notifications bell. I just try to break that thing because man, we're trying to get this algorithm to pop. So we appreciate y'all. Thanks. We'll see you next time for now. Train on.